1993, on a drive from Chattanooga to Nashville, Fred Dalton Thompson, lawyer, movie star, and future senator and TV star, engaged me in a long and detailed discussion on campaign finance reform. Having served as Howard Baker's minority counsel during Watergate, Fred remarked how the campaign finance reforms implemented post-Watergate 20 years early, earlier had given rise to an equally dysfunctional system. Tonight's guest argues in his new book, quote, however noble their goal, campaign finance laws have imposed a monetary straitjacket that is literally shutting down our competitive two-party election process. I met Rod Smith in 1980 when I was running my first U.S. Senate race and Rod was serving as finance director for the National Republican Senatorial Committee. Uh, I hesitate to, to tell you that I met anybody 26 years ago, but uh, that is true. Rod's efforts at the National Republican Senate Committee turned basically an insignificant committee into a financial powerhouse. And the money that he raised fueled the Republican takeover of the Senate in that year. Rod is a highly respected, consummate professional. He is the only individual, the only individual to have served as finance director of all three national party committees, the Senate Campaign Committee, the Republican National Committee, and the National Republican Congressional Committee. And in fact, Rod has raised over a billion dollars for GOP committees and candidates during his career. He's uniquely qualified to speak to our topic, and we're delighted to have him with us tonight at the Dole Institute of Politics. Please welcome Rod Smith. Thank you, Bill. And thank you all for coming. Believe me, it's, a, it's an honor for me to uh, be able to talk to you tonight. And uh, I hope I can say something that uh, interests you and uh, gives you some pause for thought in terms of this complicated subject called campaign finance reform. The book is Money, Power, and Elections, How Campaign Finance Reform subverts American democracy, all right? Bill told you about my Republican credentials, and they're considerable. I'm the one that has GOP tags in DC, all right? Because of that, I went to great lengths to try and make this book, not a Republican book, not a conservative book, but a book that was written by a concerned American, basically me. And in order to position myself to give myself some credibility as a nonpartisan on this issue, I wanted an academic institution to publish it. And thanks to somebody that's in the audience tonight and somebody I want to personally thank to this audience, Dr. David Perlmutter, who was at LSU University and was the person who is the editor of the book and was the person that enabled me to run the gauntlet that every academic institution requires of a book uh, prior to publication uh, to get it approved and ultimately published. And David, if you'd stand, I want to thank you very much for your efforts so you all know him because he's, thank you. <laughs> that disclaimer is important to me because this book is self-financed. There's no institution that wrote me a check to do that. And it cost me a lot of time, it cost me a lot of money, and I didn't write it to make money. I wrote it because I'm concerned about a process that I've been involved with for 30 years. So when I make the statement the campaign finance reform is destroying the fundamental fabric of American democracy as envisioned by our founding fathers, it's not done casually. And this book, is I'm a CPA by training. It has a lot of charts, documentations. I took the time to develop a database. And one of the things that LSU required was to take this database going from 1920 through 1976, the base year. Campaign finance reform first came into effect in 1976. So I take the base years from 1920 to 76, take those results and compare them to what actually happened from 1976 through 2000, which happens to be uh, the period that I measured. And when you begin to see such things as a 60% drop 
and the number of challengers defeating incumbents, it sort of gets your attention. There were some 6,000 elections that, uh, that, that happened between 76 and, and 2000. And so the database that they insisted on having audited by uh, Clyde Wilcox, a separate PhD that took several months and not an inconsiderable amount of dollars to get them to independently verify it. So if anything, the book is an attempt at a nonpartisan, independent evaluation of an election process that I think I know something about since I spent 30 years doing that. And I simply say that because I know you're, this is an academic group. I doubt that there's few people here that don't have an opinion on the subject. But, uh, and certainly I have an opinion on the subject, but I have tried to put it in the context of not a Republican, not a Democrat, not a conservative, not a liberal, but simply somebody that's concerned about the process. The American people have consistently missed the connection between campaign finance reform and the loss of free speech. And if you remember nothing else about tonight, remember this. Free speech isn't free. It takes money to exercise speech. You've got to, have, you've got to accumulate. Money is not speech. It's simply the, any more than it's food or medicine. But the only way you can acquire medicine or food and speech is by accumulating the dollars to purchase it. And the question is, how do you do that? Campaign finance reform isn't the only electoral problem facing this country, but it's the core problem. And until we deal with that core problem, all the ancillary problems are just going to hang there. You can deal with them, but until you come square to face with the fact that the reduction of dollars has just strangled competition in this country, we're going to continue to languish. The great folly in campaign finance reform is the ill-conceived belief that government can control the flow of money into elections without also substantially dictating winners and losers. And these laws, when you get into the nuances of them, as a practical matter, that's what's happening. Rather than purging big money these of, of politics, what these laws have really done is basically gotten democracy out of our system. And they threaten our very foundation if we don't do anything about them. <laughs> the unintended consequences include the following. One of the great tragedies of campaign finance reform, and something else you need to keep in mind, is you no longer live in a free democracy. You live in a managed democracy. And government interference is basically what's controlling mostly the winners and losers. And I'll give you some examples before the evening is out. The truth is, as I said earlier, campaign, or, or the free speech isn't free. It takes money. Otherwise, candidates are speechless. And the reforms have weakened the financial stability of political parties. And I'll try and explain to you their role in, 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 in terms of how they are um, ideally, at least according to the founding fathers. And what this book does is try and take the process that our founding fathers envisioned when they came up with this new form of government called American democracy. One of the things that, uh, the other thing it does, it, the, these laws have forced big money underground. And so you now have these renegade 527 groups that nobody knows quite where the money coming from that can, that, that, that can hijack an election um, with seeming impunity. These, they're, they're notorious and their tactics are getting worse. It's shifted the odds, another unintended consequence is these laws have shifted the odds of winning mostly to the wealthy and incumbents. And the reason for that is the wealthy has all the money they need simply by writing their own check and incumbents are first in line in terms of the trough of dollars that are available. They get first dabs at it and, and it's uh, any, any challenger sort of gets the, um, the crumbs. <laughs> in presidential politics, once, in, and I'm going to get into some of this in a little more detail, um, basically what it does, if you accept the federal subsidy, which the uh, government allows you, you cease to be able to run a national campaign and uh, you lose control of your message. And so, as I mentioned at a dinner earlier, and I will go over in a little more detail uh, tonight, uh, one of the things that you will see in 208 
is an attempt by both parties to try and privately fund the general election, bypassing this uh, government subsidy, which is guessed to be $80, $80 million. So when I say campaign finance reform is destroying the fundamental fabric of American democracy, what I specifically mean, and the concept you have to keep in mind is, majorities cannot protect you, but minorities, special interest groups, can destroy you. Example, Iraq. They went through a, um, an election. A majority of the people want the Constitution, but a small, very vocal minority don't want to play by the rules. They don't believe in the system. They have no confidence in their election process, so they're determined through violence to over, over, overthrow that mandate. The strength of our system is that the losing side in our election process accepts the loss because they felt they had a chance to compete, they felt they were heard, and they think that the next time maybe they can win. As it becomes more and more apparent that they can't win, that they have no say, it's going to undermine the uh, process to the point that it's not inconceivable, you'd have to come up with some variables that I can't project, that uh, unrest of varying sorts uh, could very easily begin to threaten our process as people feel more and more disfranchised and more and more out of touch with what's going on and they can't figure out what to do about it. Uh, and if you, uh, so, you know, this loss of confidence can, uh, can be very dangerous. But to try and understand campaign finance reform and how it has negatively impacted us relative to what our founding fathers had in mind, the first thing you got to do is figure out what our founding fathers had in mind. In order to do that, you've got to go back and have some understanding of what the world was like when the American Constitution, you know, the Declaration of Independence, and all these great documents that we revere and our founding fathers were in being and collected this. Go back to 1776 for a second. There is a king in England and France. There's a Tsarina in Russia. There is a Sultan in, 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 in Constantinople, an emperor in Peking, a shogun in Japan. The world is awash with totalitarianism and had for 2,000 years. There hadn't been a democracy of any consequence or a republic since Rome. So here you've got the, 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 these, the, these men that don't like the king of England. They've just overthrown him, and with this as a backdrop, decide to create something totally new. The foundation of that new government is the most basic. The first question they had to ask themselves was, who's going to be sovereign? What sovereign means, who's going to be sovereign, is who's in control? Who's the ultimate authority? In a, in a monarch, the king is the ultimate authority, and if you've I'm sure heard about the divine right of kings. Divine right of king, king gets his power from God. Citizens have no say at all. In a parliamentary procedure, with people mistakenly compared to us, parliament is the sovereign, the ultimate authority, not the people. The parliament is. In a theocracy, God is the ultimate authority. The game is who talks to God, but he's the ultimate authority. In America, what our founding fathers wanted and actually set up was that the people, you, are the ultimate authority. And, and, and what they cared about was freedom, was liberty. The problem with liberty is it's not a state of being, it's not a political principle, it's simply a state of being. And you're free to the degree, what, what counts is who is sovereign, who's the one that has the, the ultimate say. So their concept was the, pit, the people would be the ultimate authority and that they would make the decisions free from any outside interference by some higher uh, authority. And, and <coughs> when you understand America, America is not a nation in the traditional sense. There's no race or religion or ethnic, ethnicity that binds us. It's, there's only, it's a belief in the principles that are in three pieces of paper, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. That's what binds us together. And there are four, there are four branches of government, not three. There's the presidency, there's the Congress, there's the Supreme Court, and there's the people. 
the people being the ultimate authority, and they exercise that authority through the, through the um, election process. So what our founding fathers were trying to do, it wasn't, they weren't trying to create a democracy. They were trying to create a balanced republic. And the truth of the matter is the word democracy isn't even mentioned in those three sacred documents that we uh, so closely revere. So the Declaration of Independence, where, where it says, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the creators with certain inalienable rights. One of those is self-government, this idea of free speech or that you are the ultimate authority in, 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 in that the power flows from the people as opposed to the government giving you some, some rights. And uh, the Declaration of Independence affirms that. <coughs> the idea was that henceforth power would flow from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down. That's the way our system of government was set up. So when they ratified the Constitution, or the ratification process of the American Constitution, which, by the way, was the first of its kind in the history of the world, it was done in a very open and above manner. It was, you know, they, they, they elected uh, at special delegations in each of the 13 states, and the delegates that went there were voted on specifically to vote on this new document called the Constitution. There were two opposing political philosophies. They didn't have parties, per se, but they certainly had opposing political philosophies, and that was the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. They had issue ads. Federalist papers uh, were a form of issue ads. They had fat cats. Alexander Hamilton spent, for example, whatever he needed to put out these newspaper ads spreading the, the, uh, his Federalist position of how he thought the... Um, the um, the campaign should go because the ratification of the American Constitution in truth was the first election in this country and the Constitution was the first candidate. And the first stage of that process was to give it to the Congress of the then Federation. Uh, and, and, and what happened there, and it's an important thing that happened, there was a stalemate. The Federalists and the Anti-Federalists could not agree on what should be done, uh, whether they should approve or recommend the Constitution for passing or not. And the reason they couldn't was because the Constitution by itself is a fairly authoritarian document. There were no individual liberties uh, protected. And if you, the, the, the Articles of Confederation protected these liberties that our founding fathers were so concerned about. But the Constitution didn't, <laughs> as it was written. So what happens is the Constitution goes to the 13 delegations. And what happens is the Constitution is going into the waste bin of history. It's not going to pass. In Massachusetts, you get John Adams and John Hancock. There's actually a written agreement. And this is important. It's just, some people think they passed the Constitution. They went around and ratified 10 amendments to add to it to protect individual liberties. And that's not how it happened at all. What happens is the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists actually create a written deal. The deal is, if we ratify the Constitution, immediately afterwards, there will be a Bill of Rights protecting these rights that we just fought a revolution for that are mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. And both sides agree to that. Both sides agree to that. The Constitution is ratified, and the first thing that happens is that those 10 amendments are added. These, these 10 amendments uh, are added to the, the Constitution. And what you have to understand about that is those 10 amendments that were added to the American Constitution are the most sweeping guarantees of individual liberties in the history of mankind. There was nothing before or since to match what they put in in terms of the protection of yours and my rights. As, 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 and and <coughs> in protecting those rights, what John Marshall did when he, in his famous Marlboro and Madison, which creates this right of judicial review, what they're, what, 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 what they're saying is <coughs> you have the Constitution, you have the Bill of Rights, and that, these, that the Bill of Rights were setting up rights that the government could not 
mess with. This was beyond the reach of the federal government. They were not to touch our individual liberties. And specifically, what John Marshall says in his Marbury versus Madison decision, which sets up the right of judicial review, the power of the legislatures are defined and limited and that those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten, the Constitution is written. And it was the job of the Supreme Court to look at laws passed by the Congress to make sure that they didn't infringe on those rights. The most basic rights are spelled out in the First, in the first Amendment. Congress shall make no law with respect to the establishment of religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof, or the abridgment of free speech or of the press. Could not be more clear what they were trying to do, and if you go to the Federalist Papers, which were written by the Federalists to assure the Anti-Federalists that we would never trample on those rights, it even makes it more clear. Because what the framers understood and wanted were competitive elections, were un open and unrestricted debate, would educate the population while it simultaneously selected its leaders. That's the game, that's this, 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 this game that they created. It's a very messy, you might say, process, but it's a competitive game where the best candidates and the best ideas are the ones that ultimately rise up to the top and um, ultimately guide the future of this country. Key to that process was the free flow of information because they felt that information, the free flow of information, was the only way truth could come out because any form of communications, be it by a candidate or a party or a special interest group, has a slant to it. It's your job as the electorate to read all those varying details and hear them all and then decide which one you choose to think is the most important. And the collectiveness of that is what the will of the people represents. And that was this process that they put in place and free speech was the foundation. Free speech is the, is, the, is the armor, really, that was created by the founding fathers to protect the integrity of the whole system. Because without free speech, you don't know what you're voting for. You don't know what's going on. What the Supreme Court did in 1976 in its Buckley-Vallejo decision was basically tell us that might makes right. Because they could make the decision, they did. And I think they made a terrible, terrible decision because what they did in that decision was to put the whole concept of free speech as it's been defined by our founding fathers in play. It no longer, what they said was, no, Congress can go and mess with your rights. They can limit your free speech, even though the founding, the, 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 in, in, in Mulberry versus Madison, uh, the Supreme Court clearly was trying to make sure that the Congress never got out. It, all the documentation as it was set up by the Founding Fathers clearly suggests that our rights were to be protected, specifically the right of free speech, particularly the right of free speech as it relates to political speech. And so in my judgment, what the, what, what, what the, what the Supreme Court said in its Buckley-Vallejo decision is, that the Constitution, as envisioned by the Founding Fathers, is just a little bit unconstitutional. Let you think about it for a second. How can you, the guy that created it, write something that's just a little bit unconstitutional? It doesn't make any sense, except that's what they did. And what they did in doing that was, in my judgment, put themselves above the Constitution. They now said, we don't, as far as I'm concerned, if you can't take words Congress shall pass no law abridging freedom of speech and simply ignore that and say, oh, yes, they can, of what value is the rest of it? It's not like, let's say, um, the line item veto. They said there's no line item veto. Well, guess what? There is no line item veto in the Constitution. You either see it or you don't. But it's, there's nothing that says anything about it. So when they said there's no line item veto, it's kind of hard to argue with. There's no words that say there is or isn't. It's an interpretation. But when they say you no longer have freedom of speech, when it clearly says you do have freedom of speech, in my judgment, they've certainly gutted the, or demonstrated they, 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 they have no respect for the words in, in the Constitution. What they have done, when you read what they said, <coughs> here's what they say. We observe, and they admit that they're gutting the Constitution. We observe that the constitutional limits impose only the constitutional limits 
on freedom of speech, only a marginal restriction upon the contribution ability engage in free communication. Only marginal. In other words, they're admitting they're doing it. It's just a question they think it's only marginal. Our treatment of contribution restrictions reflect the more than a limited burden they impose on the First Amendment. So they're basically admitting that they're modifying the First, admit, uh, the first Amendment. The primary purpose and served by the, by the prevention of corruption, the reason here is what they're concerned about is corruption, the possibility of the corruption or money, of which there was no evidence then, it still hasn't been any proven cases, but more importantly, the perception of the corruption of money is what they were concerned about. The only problem with that line of reasoning is that's not the main, that's the, 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 the primary evil of politics, if you want to look at it, or the base evil of politics is not money. The root problem or the root evil in politics is the lust for power. Money to a power-hungry politician is simply a means to an end. And the founding fathers understood that, and they had a balanced document that tried to balance this, the, 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 this power-money consendrum. And what they basically said was, leave it to the people to make the ultimate decision. If somebody's, you know, and, and if you had full disclosure, excuse me, and you knew what somebody was spending, and, and it was all above board, the simple thing to do would be, hey, you don't vote for them. Um, let me move on here. Uh, <clears throat> what we have now, in my judgment, um, is a lot of elections, very few campaigns. A campaign is where you have candidates truly vying with one another, trying to ex educate the electorate, and actually having a chance of winning. When we talk this fall about whether the Republicans are going to retain control or lose control, of the House, which is all over the news, that's not really the big story. The big story is how few competitive elections there are this November. Under anybody's count, Republican and Democrat alike, you'd be lucky if you can find 35 competitive elections, of which the Republicans probably have 27 or so, and they might lose enough to lose control. But what that's saying is, better than 90% of the other ones, there's no competition at all. And when you study the numbers, that there's not, no competition is basically because there's no money to have any competition. And, and, and so when you look through this book, you will see such things as, as I told you earlier, if you take the base period from, 2000, or from uh, 1920 to 76 and then measure it against the control period of 76, there's been a 60% decline in the number of of uh, incumbents or challengers beating incumbents. When you uh, look at the Senate, from 1992 through 2000, 15 senators, forget Republican or Democrat, lost. 15 senators lost, and without exception, there's not a single exception to this, every one of them lost to somebody that spent on average three and a half million dollars of their own money. So they didn't lose to just, Joe Average candidate on the street. They lost to somebody that had a huge amount of personal wealth. They wanted to go in and defeat them. And, and, and so what you have is in the House almost no competitive elections because there's no money to have a competitive election. In the Senate, where there is competition, it's usually funded uh, by somebody with, you know, deep pockets is what it boils down to. So um, <coughs> what we need in my judgment is, is, is to do away with these silly limitations, not silly, dangerous really, and go back to what our founding fathers had in mind, which is full disclosure. Let's open the system up, put it above board. There's lots of ways that you can document a significant contribution so that it's more name, address, and phone number. That, that, you know, why did you take it? Why did you give it? I mean, I could concoct a lot of ways that would be done quick enough and fast enough so that everybody that was involved in the electoral process would know exactly how the campaign was funded and then candidates would have enough money to have their side of the argument heard, draw people into the process and have more debate, not less debate, which is something I think this, this, this country uh, desperately, desperately needs. So um, 
I got one other thing I want to say. I'm going to stop talking about my book because I go on for another half hour and I'm just trying to skip through my notes. I want to very briefly touch on, you say, okay, what about, and I mentioned this in our dinner, but I think it's important you all understand, <laughs> 2008. 2008 is an, uh, is an example, and you're going to see it, of just how distorted these laws have made our election process. We've only had eight presidential elections under campaign finance reform since 76, all right? This will be the ninth. So we really, we really have not had that much experience with presidential campaigns. We don't know what the unintended consequences are. The first election in 76 was a disaster in the sense that neither candidate, they were both given $10 million. They didn't know how much money was on the table. The, the Carter campaign went into negative spending. Uh, the Ford campaign probably didn't spend all they could have because they didn't know how much money they had because they had a poor accounting system, as mundane as that sounds. Uh, Ford lost that election by an average of one vote per precinct in Ohio. Had he better managed his money, it's possible he could have channeled money into that campaign and won that. What's generally not known is when Carter was beginning to falter prior to the nomination in 76, there was this guy named Hubert Humphrey that um, wanted to jump in and could have under the old rules, but he quickly learned he couldn't accumulate enough money to have an impact, and so he was forced not to even try. So, the, so his co competition never even, never even happened. If you go back to 1968, some of you probably weren't around then, but some of you remember it, I do, uh, when, when, when uh, Eugene McCarthy was running in New Hampshire in a write-in, in a write-in campaign against a sitting president, Lyndon Johnson, gets 41% of the vote. Johnson gets 49% of the vote. Three weeks later, Johnson quits the presidential election. That campaign that McCarthy ran was funded by a few large donations, people that gave him a quarter of a million, half a million dollars, fully disclosed. Can't happen today. Those kinds of historic events are impossible. You can't come up with the money to do it unless you're independently wealthy or have a huge financial base uh, to begin with. It's simply a thing of the past. When you start talking about 2008, <laughs> we've had 76 was a problem. Then you go 90, 94, 98, 92, 96. They tried to play by the rules. The rules were such that he who raised the most in matching funds the year preceding the election won the primary. No exceptions. No exceptions. So then you go to 2000. 2000, Bush breaks the mold. He decides to privately fund the campaign. He raises $100 million. So when John McCain beats him by near 20 points in New Hampshire, which, was, which would usually have been a disaster for most candidates, he had enough cash on hand to bury McCain in $100 bills in, in, in South Carolina, Michigan, and, and did. And, and even though McCain raised some money, he couldn't m begin to match the money that Bush had, and uh, Bush won that, that nomination. Then you go to 2004, where you have Kerry and Bush both bypassing matching funds, the hell with his government subsidy, and uh, both of them raised well over $200 million, and Kerry himself has said the mistake he made in that campaign was taking the federal subsidy during the general election. Because the, the decision not to respond to the swift, get, swift boat attacks was as much an accounting decision as it was a political decision. They didn't have enough money. They hadn't budgeted for that. It came out of nowhere. And so they had an internal discussion about where we got the money to respond to this. By the time they got around into responding, it was too late. It had taken it, and for a lot of different reasons, he ends up losing. He says is his biggest mistake. One of the things that will happen in 2008 is that both national campaigns will attempt to, publicly, to privately finance their campaign. They will not, if they can possibly avoid it, take the $80 million. Now, what does that mean? Well, one candidate, assume the Democrat, and I'll mention her name because she's in the press, uh, Hillary, will probably come out of this Senate election with $20 million or $30 million cash in the bank. I mean, it's, just, it's a phenomenal fundraising success. She's unbelievable. She can take, here's how the, just so you understand how the law works. She can take that bank account, call it her 2012 bank account, 
run that rabbit one more time, now raise another 40, 50 million dollars. This time next year have, you pick the number, 60, 70 million dollars in a bank account. Call that bank account her presidential primary campaign, run the rabbit again, have well over 100 million dollars. She's going to be very difficult to stop. She's going to be very difficult to stop. Imagine whether she runs or not, I don't know. She certainly hasn't told me. But if she were, by March, she could easily have enough money to be the nominee. If she is, or the apparent nominee, she will simply set up a separate bank account, take that whole donor base, and now attempt to privately fund her general election. Imagine, she, and her nomination will be the end of August. Imagine if she's got $200 million in the bank. She announces to the world she's not taking the, match, the, 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 the government subsidy. She's going to privately fund her campaign. One week later, a Republican is going to get the presidential nominee. Now, your opponent has just told you they're going to outspend you if you take the federal subsidy four or five to one. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'll tell you one option he has, or she has, whoever it is that has that nomination. They can take a very rich Republican and make it their vice presidential appointment. And then say, now loan us our campaign. Joint can loan, not give, loan. This is what Kerry did. It's in my book, if you want to know. And, and two, he loaned his campaign to win New Hampshire and Iowa. Loan your campaign $100, $200 million. Now the role of the vice president becomes to finance the general election, not to be president. Now, if that weren't bad enough, imagine if an independent third candidate were to pop in and somehow manage to win a handful of electoral votes. The whole election could be easily thrown in the House of Representatives, which hasn't happened since 1824. So the possibility could be that the Democrat let's assume if it were Hillary or whomever, but the Democrats, certainly Al Gore did it in 2000, could get a majority of the popular vote, but not get a majority of the electoral vote. And if you want to complicate it even further, assume the Democrats take control of the House this fall. They now have control of the House. It's now being thrown in their lap. The way the Electoral College works in the House of Representatives, each state gets one vote. So all those Democrats in California have one vote, just as the one Republican in Wyoming has one vote. The Republicans control the Electoral College. So all of a sudden, the election could be given, vis-a-vis -vis the House of Representatives, to the Republican, even though the Democrat won a majority of the vote in a, in a contentious process that will make Florida look like a walk in the park. And that's only the beginning. Because once that process happens once, and people now understand that I can become a power broker, maybe this third candidate doesn't let it go to the House. Maybe he says, I want to be vice president, or she, or whoever it is. Now what you're going to see is everybody and their uncle trying to run for president on a, not win the presidency, but win a couple electoral votes. Deny the majority to the major parties. It's a power play. Think what instability that brings to our process. All in the name of campaign finance reform, under the theory that we're afraid of this unproven, you know, the possibility of the perception of the corruption of money is basically destroying our election process, and we've got to wake up to that effect. Thank you. I'll take some questions. Yes, sir, back there. <laughs> Let me remind you, please, if you have a question, raise your hand in either Lindsay or Sarah, do you want to ha have this mic? Uh, we'll uh, bring the mic to you, and uh, please don't ask your question until the mic is, is in front of you. Let me take a moment, I meant to do this before, to recognize Dr. Chapman Rackaway and his students who came all the way from Fort Hayes State tonight. Thank you guys for coming. Yes, sir. Hi, yes, I'm also yes, from... Go ahead. Hi, I'm also from Fort Hayes State. Um, the Introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Mike Tweed. Thanks, um, Mike. I'm new in the political science department there. Um, uh, the underlying assumption here is that freedom of speech uh, allows us to give as much money as we want as individuals. By that definition, it would seem that somebody like Bill Gates uh, would have more freedom than I do. Um, what if we... Com you're arguing that limiting... Uh, um, 
the dollars that go into elections is is bad thing. We should completely make it unlimited. What if we completely limited private in any got rid of all of it, individual funding of campaigns, funding from corporations, funding from PACs, five twenty sevens, whatever, <coughs> and had publicly funded campaigns. Let um, me, yeah, go, is, go, is that your question? And, and that by that by that I think you, I mean I'm no expert on this. <laughs> it's not my field, um, but. Uh, wouldn't that strengthen the party system, allow people to participate in the, in the, in the system uh, by getting involved in politics through the party system and then working their way through the party system to become the candidate that the, the party wants and then, um, as the founders envision, as you say, that, that the issues should be what matters. Uh, shouldn't, wouldn't that promote uh, more let, let, let me answer your question in, 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 in this way. I'm not advocating that we do away with the limits. I'm advocating that we rediscover our roots. Our founding fathers created a structure that is in the Constitution. If we want to change that structure, they included in the Constitution a way of doing that. If we want to do what you just suggested, and it may be a good idea, it may not be a good idea, the way to do it is to offer a constitutional amendment, have it debated, go through the process. The system that we just swept off the table with no debate, no thought about. There wasn't, the Senate didn't even hold a public hearing on it. Should be through the amendment of the Constitution. I am not smart enough to tell somebody how to recreate a um, system of government. What our founding fathers said is that you are, you the people are the ultimate authority. If as you suggest, Bill Gates wants to give me a billion dollars, as long as that is publicly, disclosed and everybody knows about it, they have a right not to vote for me. That's your right. California, the gentleman that ran against uh, um, Schwarzenegger, took a lot of corporate dollars and once it became a parent, he dropped like a stone. And so your suggestion that some rich person, it's not that, you know, inequality does not equal corruption. Inequality does not equal corruption. He simply has more resources. And the mere fact that you have $1,000 and you give $10, that's 1% of your net income. If he has $100 million and he gives a $1 million, that's 1% of his. It doesn't make your contribution any better or worse than his. His simply has a higher utility of value than yours, and it simply has to be dealt with in the sense that there needs to be full disclosure. There needs to be more done about making sure everybody understands that contribution, because what's the contribution going to be used for? It's going to be used to communicate with the people. It's not like he's putting it in his pocket. It's not, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it goes to try and enhance the system, get people educated and get people to vote. So what I'm simply advocating is we rediscover our roots. Yes, sir. Let, take your... Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rod Smith, I greatly admire greatly admire what you said about the Constitution and your scholarship and respect of uh, looking at what the Constitution actually says as opposed to what uh, is worked out in the, in the, uh, oh, the devil in the details, so to speak, as it's worked out by people in the world. I was greatly upset in the penultimate last election when the Supreme Court uh, took it upon itself, finally, in, in accepting uh, the case and not throwing it out, that interfered with what I think are the rules spelled out in the Constitution for uh, selecting, for uh, the states selecting their electors right. to go to the Congress. Now, my question for you, sir, and I'm, I'm really on the edge of my chair to hear this because this is a pet subject of mine. If I ever ran for president, I'd certainly make a point of this myself. Uh, I would like to see, and what do you think of, a constitutional amendment that will reinforce and say they are to, the Supreme Court has its place, it's very important in the interpretation of the laws, but that it has no right to interfere with the specified methods of elector of selecting electors. All right, let, let me speak to that because you, you bring up, <coughs> the, 
the American Constitution is a skeletal document. It's a skeletal document. It's not 100 pages and spelling all the details. What's important about the American Constitution are the principles that support it. Government isn't any different than any other human institution that has been created. Let me give you an example we all can understand. Marriage. We all stand up in front of a group and say, for better, for worse, for richer and poorer, for sickness and health, the death of part. Those are the ideals. None of us live up to those ideals, but we try and strive for those ideals. And the weaker, the further you fall away from those ideals, the weaker that institution becomes, and at some point it crumbles. Okay? Government's the same way. Our Constitution is set upon certain principles. You can't take every word, and I, I, I'm not somebody that says you take the word and that's literally what it meant, but you certainly can take the principles that support the freedom of speech, um, separation of powers, and, and understanding those, those principles and do everything you can to support those those principles, and if, um, if an amendment, if the Supreme Court, and I think the Supreme Court has gotten grossly out of hand in terms of what at least the Federalist Papers and the discussion I've been able to read about, you know, you, you, you have Alexander Hamilton arguing, and I think Federalist 10 saying that the role of the Supreme Court, you know, that's the weakest of the three branches. He was dead wrong, as it turns out, because they have acquired power, and if you see even through the Senate confirmation process, you now have senators saying, this is a waste of time. They won't answer any questions. You can't get any information out of them. At some point, I don't know what the answer is. I'm not somebody who's going to sit here. I'm not a designer of governments. But certainly, they have gotten to the point that if they're going to act the way they're acting, then maybe they ought to be elected as opposed to appointed. At least the people then but that would require a constitutional amendment. In terms of your constitutional amendment, there is a process. And if it can survive that process and the states ratify it, then absolutely it should be, it, it, it should be added to the Constitution if that's the will of the people because the people are in charge as opposed to somebody just passing in a law and saying, geez, this is the way it is now, folks. And I, and I, and I think that the, um, that the Supreme Court at some point what they're basically doing is hiding behind this document, pretending that I'm not even sure they read it when I read some of it. Because all you, when you read their opinions, it isn't about the Constitution. It's about other judges' opinions about the Constitution. And uh, certainly campaign finance reform, I think it's the most egregious decision that has been made or likely to be made since Plessy versus Ferguson, which, I mean, which basically um, eventually was overturned. I think this will eventually be overturned. Yes, sir, do you have a question here? We've got one right here, this gentleman. I have great respect for the seniors. That, right up here, right? Like, like this one, and then you, you can be next. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Yes, sir. Uh, can you envision a way that we could get the Supreme Court to interpret the law differently? This could I envision a way? money <laughs> to the... Uh, free process situation is such that I think is, is most uh, difficult. Well, the Supreme Court is one of the four branches of government, and the way it's going to have to be dealt with is the way any change in our structure should be dealt with, and that's that there ought to be some amendment proposed in terms of how it's going to function other than who you appoint to it. There isn't any way to do it because it's an autonomous entity at this point, but even through that appointment process, they seem less and less inclined to answer even senators' questions. Senators seem very frustrated by it. Yes, sir, the gentleman back here. Yes, sir. Uh, what would you have to say to a general ban on all corporate contributions to any campaign? Because a corporation is not a person. It's, it's an instrumentality amen. that works. And neither is a labor union. People. Neither is a labor, corporate, and it's in my book, corporate, don't count. When you're talking citizen sovereignty, you're talking people, voters, individual citizens. Corporations are not voters. They're not, and they, we can do anything we want with them. If we wanted them to contribute, we could. If you don't want them, it's not a, it's not a constitutional issue, and I don't personally think their money should be involved. I think that um, it ought to be individual citizens, and in point of fact, I would probably... 
I'm not even sure they should lobby. I think if, if the officers uh, want to buy lobbyists to go do it, that, that, that's fine. Corporations are off the table, and so are labor unions in terms of whether they should be in this process. We could have them if we want, but there's no constitutional basis for doing that. So, no, I, I would agree. I wouldn't have corporations anyplace. Yes, sir? Um, one right back here. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep looking at the front. I need the back there. You, yeah, Hi. thank you. Yeah. All right. My, the preface for my question really is that this whole argument that you have seems to really be, it's not what the argument is about and it's not what the message the person has to say is. It really seems to me that you're arguing it's how much money a person can, can, can accumulate and who those people know that can get them that money. So my question to you is, what can be done? Can there be an agency created that will allow for a removal of all this, tr this lobbying to get funds from other groups and why can't the government fund it and have an agency that allows people to have equal time to get out their message? Why, wh what stands in the way of you know, true freedom of speech, as you said? There again, the premise of my book is to try and show you what the Founding Fathers had envisioned and why we should go back to what they had envisioned. When you're talking about public funding of, canter, of campaigns, when you're talking about free television and all these proposals that, quote, will make the system fair, there are allusions to solutions. They are not solutions at all. Let me give you an example. Public financing. Let's assume, because everybody seems to see this as, uh, wouldn't this solve the problem? <coughs> what you want is competition. Arizona has passed a public financing bill. Here's what would happen. Here, you have to understand the election process in terms of what's really going on. If I were an incumbent and I wanted to vote for public financing, and I would vote for it, I would set the limit at about $50,000, you know, maybe 25, you know, 50, 100, make it as low as humanly possible because I, as the incumbent, First of all, in the incumbent, the way the process works, I'll give you a very specific, a House member of the United States House of Representatives gets somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 million dollars to run their office, as they legitimately should. There's nothing wrong with that. And they decide how to fund that. And some piece of that money goes to you know, constituent communication, perfectly legitimate. Where's the bounds between that? communicating with the, in, in campaigns, you know, some people sometimes find it hard to see that line. All they would have to do is increase that allotment, decrease your campaign expenditure, and they, you might as well just cancel elections because there would be no competition because the limit would be so low. Now you would say, well, what's a reasonable limit? You know, if you can't come within almost dollar for dollar of an incumbent, you're hard pressed to beat them. There, there is something called an invisible protective shield that every incumbent has because they are the incumbent. And basically what that means is we as human beings tend to go along with the status quo unless we have a reason to change it. So if he was the winner last time, our proclivity often is to go along with that person simply because they were the winner. It's, it's, and, and, and you've got to show me why I should change my mind. That takes money. And if you have public financing, all you got to do is shut that limit down so you don't have enough money to, to do that. They also are the, um, you know, they, they have the prerogatives of the office. If you institute public financing, you might as well cancel elections. There will be no competition. In terms of this, this idea of free television, go to Los Angeles. There's 15 congressmen running in the law, greater Los Angeles area. Could you imagine what television would be like if each one of them could put on 10 events, 10 ads a day. You'd have 150 TV commercials just for one candidate times two. You know, you, all you would have is TV commercials. There's no practical way to manage that. And then once you get the government into uh, funding it, then you get into what is a generally accepted campaign ad. And all of a sudden, they water it down to the point that, you know, there won't be any elections. All those are illusions of solutions proposed by people that have no comprehension as to what a real campaign is all about. They just come up with these theoretical ideas that sound good on paper only because they don't understand the nuances, the practical 
impact of what is happening. And I've taken the time to spell a lot of it out here. If you want more details, you can read it in the book. I'll let you guys pick the next person. There we go. Um, but the media is saying that the elections, the midterm elections, that the House is going to go to the Democrats and possibly even the Senate. That's um, what the media is saying. I don't think And so. the polls. But uh, I was reading Drudge Report, and they said that the Republicans are going to outspend the Democrats five to one. Uh, how's that? What's your opinion on how that's going to affect right. the election? Think of money this way. I still haven't explained myself. You can have all the money you need in an election. You won't necessarily win. There's plenty of examples of rich people that lose. But if you don't have enough money at a critical moment, it will often cost you the campaign. It's more of a lack of money can cost you the election as opposed to too much. I mean, you had Forbes that spent $40 million and barely registered on the poor because some people have enough money to show themselves to the public. The public doesn't like them. The public ain't going to vote for them. The American populace is not stupid. What you're trying to do is to get enough money so that both sides can have a fair campaign, get their message out, get people involved, go door to door. Get, you know, and, and, and if you had larger contributions, you wouldn't have to spend two years raising it. It would sh actually shorten the election uh, process. In terms of this fall, what, you know, the Republicans have more money to spend as to how they're going to, there's now saying they're going to spend it on negative campaigns. I think that, that what you see, because I've been there on the Congress, I know how these games are played. You've got the candidate money, you've got the party money, you've got the outside interest money. There's a lot of money spent in these campaigns. If the candidate doesn't have enough to really have table stakes to play, what the party spends and the rest, you know, just falls by the wayside. The candidate is still the focal point. The candidate's campaign is still the focal point. The candidate has to have the money. And too many candidates don't have enough money. As to the reason the Republicans, you know, the money will help them, but also they're the incumbents, and there aren't enough. If you've got 30 races, and that's all there are that are in play, the Democrats are going to concentrate on those and the Republicans are going to concentrate on there. If there were 300 races that were in play, Republican and Democrat, you couldn't concentrate your wealth quite the same, and, the, and, 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 and you would have a lot more competition. So part of the reason the Republican money seems so great is because there's so few elections to spend it on. And um, when you say, I think there are 11 open seats, nine of them, the Republicans could lose. Where they're going to pick up the other six? Some of the Republicans could lose. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, if they lose, it's going to be by very many votes. And one of the things you have to keep in mind, even if they do lose, let's assume the Democrats take over, we're not a parliamentary form of government. That's only one house. In order to try and get anything done, you still got the Senate to deal with. You still got the president to deal with. After two years, the Democrats were stalemate continues to be the, the game in Washington, um, it's going to create even more frustration. So, you know, I don't know that the Republicans' uh, um, money, I don't know the Democrats um, have that little money, it's just that there are so few races that the candidates themselves have enough to make a difference is what upsets me, not the party, although the parties are much weaker. $50 million sounds like a lot of money, but when you spread it across 435 races or 500, you know, it's not that much. Hold on, I'll let them. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming out and really challenging the sort of accepted orthodoxy about campaign finance reform. At the very least, you've added something to, to the dialogue that's very valuable. So I thank, thank you, you for that. Now, you've been talking about competitiveness in elections, and there's a pretty significant strain in the political science literature showing that for incumbents, having a nice big fat war chest is a great preventative against strong income or against strong challengers coming in and trying to uh, trying to take that seat away. So what I'm wondering is, if we take those limits away as you've prescribed, if we are maybe exacerbating the advantage that incumbents can have in doing that early fundraising and fighting off more quality challengers, in effect, wouldn't that 
undermine exactly the thing that you're trying to accomplish, which is increase competitiveness in elections, because those quality challengers are going to be scared off with bigger, bigger incumbent war chests uh, going on. You need to, you know, back to what I said earlier, you can have all the money you need, you won't necessarily win. Well, one point I want to make is, first of all, the purpose of an election isn't simply to pick winners and losers. The purpose of an election is to educate the electorate. So even if the incumbent continually gets reelected, if there's a competitive race, a true competitive race, incumbents become vulnerable because they vote in certain ways that upset their constituents. And if the constituents really understand that, and the only way they can understand it is the other side is pounding away at them, it can, it can, it can, um, it can, it can weaken them. The closer that the, 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 the problem in Washington, if you want to know, it's ego, it, it, it's ego driven, it's, it, it's the lust for power, the ego driven lust for power overcoming reason and common sense. And where does that come from? If I win with 98% of the vote and I do it for 10 election cycles, I'm now there 20 years, I think I'm a pretty special guy. Why do I have to listen to the constituents? It's this, I become an independent. We're all susceptible potentially to it. It's, it's called Potomac fever. And it's the, one of the reasons that you have this stagnation in Washington is there are so few people that have any real challenge at home. They can do what they damn well please. If you had a more competitive election, it's not that you're going to beat the incumbents necessarily. You're going to put them in a more competitive election. What has happened when you measure the number of close races that happened from 1920 to 1976, and then you measure the number of close races, winning by 2.5% or less, I mean, it's like a 40% decline. When you see people winning by more than 15%, there's like a 30% increase. I mean, what you have are fewer and fewer competitive elections, more and more runaway victories, and more and more people in Washington that pay lip service to being, um, let's say, swayed by what their constituents think. They run elections, they, they run campaigns. It's an attitude. We're all, it's not that they're bad people, we're all susceptible to that. We need a competitive process where they feel they need to look over their shoulder, where they feel they need to seriously listen to their constituents, where their constituents are getting educated and feel like they've had a say, where they feel like they've been involved, where somebody's knocked on their door and explained the issues to them, where we all get re-energized and re-involved as opposed to turn our back and discuss and say, this system doesn't work. It doesn't work because we're, there's not enough of us that are involved because there's, there's not enough debate in this country. There's not too much debate. There's not enough debate that really, that, that really matters. And the only way you're going to increase that debate is to get some funding to candidates so that they can exercise that debate and re-energize the process. Yes, sir. Your premise is that we need to get more competitiveness into our campaigns that we need to level the playing field. You also state that uh, the answer to that is to take away the restrictions and to let all the money that wants to flow into elections. I, am I characterizing that more or less correctly? Well, it was one point. My premise is to rediscover our roots. So let's go back to what our founding fathers set up. I mean, that's, that's American democracy as they envisioned it. Yeah, the free flow of ideas and right. uh, competitive races would bring out lots of ideas and lots of challengers. Yet what has happened is since 1976, I think there was about a half billion dollars in all uh, federal elections spent that year. In 2000, that number was up to, in 2004, I think it was, it was up to about four billion, so an eight-fold increase. So during the same period of time where you're tracking an increase or, or a decrease in competitiveness where more and more the incumbent wins, we're also tracking an increase in dollars. So it doesn't follow to me that if we let more dollars into the campaigns that we're going to have an increase in, in uh, competitiveness. And further, I'd like to go back to 1971 when the Federal Election Campaign Act was passed. That's what the Buckley Vallejo decision is really about. Uh, and the Supreme Court doesn't say there can be no money in campaigns. What the Supreme Court says is that free speech, uh, that the spending of money to influence campaigns is 
is a, is an, a free exercise is an exercise of free speech, and uh, Justice White, in his dissent, said the Supreme Court got it all wrong. That Congress was specifically very knowledgeable about campaigns and campaign financing, and if those guys who are experts on it, because they have to raise the money, in 1971 passed a law that tried to get all money out, maybe we should respect that uh, position that they took. In other words, what what Congress tried to do wasn't the Supreme Court in 76, it was Congress in 71 that said, the way that we can uh, make this world a little more, or this campaign process a little bit more competitive is to take as much money out of it as possible and level the playing field for everybody. And I think maybe Congress was right because what we've seen since 71, since 76, is an increase in dollars and a decrease in competitiveness. So right. I'm not sure. Let, that it's I time. Let me answer your question proposal. this way because it's an interesting point. It's time for a test. <laughs> Here's a test. If I told you there was a candidate that spent $195, they spent $195 in an election where there's 794 votes. So you spent $195 in an election where there were 794 votes. That averages 25 cents per vote that that candidate spent. Would anybody here think that's an egregious amount of money? Is that too much money? Is that too much money, sir? Is anybody here that thinks that's too much money? Is that an outrageous sum of money to spend in an election? $195 for 794 votes, spend an average of 25 cents per vote. Sounds reasonable. Does anybody think that's excessive? All right. The candidate was George Washington. The year was 1758. If you take that money, increase it by the voting age population, and adjust it by the most conservative number for inflation that you can come up with, in 2004, we should have spent a half, somewhere between 250 million and a half of billion dollars each candidate uh, should have spent in the presidential campaign. It's called inflation, it's called the increase in the population. So these absolute numbers, i.e. from 76 it was this, from now it's that, don't mean anything. George, if George Washington could be used as an example, then in the presidential campaign, it shouldn't be $80 million we should be giving him if we were giving him anything at all. They should be allowed to spend to have the same kind of impact he had in his election, somewhere between 250 and $500 million. The problem with the numbers that you're throwing around is that money is pretty much the numbers that you're throwing around in terms of where the dollars are, all this money and less competition. It's all in incumbents' accounts. It's all stashed in one place because they're the only ones that have access to the trough. Somebody mentioned corporate contributions. We've outlawed corporate contributions. You know where corporate contributions go now? They go to buy lobbying firms in Washington. You know what lobbying firms do with that? They hire staff. You know what staff does with that? They get big salaries so they can go make contributions because that's their access. And so what you have evolving in Washington are professional donors. They don't care about anything other than gaining access when you, the people, are the ones that should be given that money. But you've been trivialized by the nature of the way these laws go. If I could pass one law, I guess at this point, given I'd outlaw all fundraising in Washington and take off all the limits of ordinary citizens. You all should support the system. You all should participate in the system. You all should control the system. And that's what our founding fathers had in, had in mind. And if we took these limits off, these few examples that people are afraid of, Bill Gates and the like, would be fully disclosed. And I can't imagine if I were running for Congress in the district here, and Bill Gates gave me a million dollars, and every one of you knew about it, that you're not smart enough to figure out, maybe that is something I don't want to support. So I'm not going to vote for Rod. It's not a hard process to figure out. It's been my experience in 30 years in politics that the American populace is actually very smart. And if we just take the controls off of them, get the federal government out of the process, let it back to the freewheeling system, fully disclose, everybody knows what's going on, it's going to be a lot more vibrant, a lot more... Um, 
turnover or whatever you want to call it, and, and a lot more responsive to what people want. Right now, what we have created, and it's important you understand this, what we've created is a political pressure cooker, and it's just boiling. One of these days, it's going to blow, and the blow is going to take, you know, throw the bums out. We'll throw all incumbents out, which isn't good either. Uh, now, what's going to trigger that blow, I don't know, but certainly an instability of the kind I suggested in a presidential campaign. It's not a pipe dream. It doesn't happen in 208. It's certainly going to happen in 212. And um, why? Because the issues, because the tension in this country is just getting so severe. And if an outrage where all of a sudden the House of Representatives is picking the president, where all of a sudden we have a third candidate people are so disgusted by that they can pick up a couple electoral votes, um, it's a very, very real possibility. If you go back and read about what happened in 1824, read about 1800, the revolution of 1800 when Jefferson comes in and the country almost comes apart because of the, the contentiousness and the 36 ballots that it took to get him into the presidency and the House of Representatives. We've been spared all that and we're about ready to re-experience it simply because we have this fear of a, of a myth of the perception of the corruption of money doesn't exist. The problem is the lust for power. And, and, and we just, for whatever reason, totally ignore that until it becomes the problem. And I hope it's not too late before we do something about it. Are there we, any other questions? We have time for one last question right here. I was wondering, uh, the idea that if you take away, uh, well, if all the campaign uh, money that comes in is documented and everyone knows. That's supposed to be the mechanism, I think what I've interpreted as your belief. Yeah, that would full take, disclosure. Full disclosure would take away um, the uncompetitive nature of the bias of having more money on one side or another because the voters would be it able would to- It would give everybody an equal chance to, to, say, to, to, it, to go out and raise the money they need to run their campaign. Now, if they were a total fool, nobody might give them any money, but at least they'd have the potential of getting it. So do you believe that if we have full disclosure that elections will center on or all of a sudden the idea of who gave how much money to who will become big, It might, big it might, and that, what that would mean is people would be very cautious about who they take money from and by how much, but they would have their choice as to, uh, you know, then it would become the candidate's responsibility, which is where it should be. And there wouldn't be any need to give a million dollars to some 527 group so that they can come in with some underhanded uh, in the night uh, smear campaign that you, know, you would have to take because there would be no need for those separations. The swift boats wouldn't have had to have happened. They could have happened. It's their right to speak that way. But in that case, they could have just as easily given the money to the Bush campaign and let the Bush campaign take the responsibility. I mean, it could have happened that way, but because of these laws, the Bush campaign could legitimately so say we can't have anything to do with it because the laws forbade it. And uh, what you want are candidates with enough money to run a responsible campaign on an above board fashion that everything that's happening, the electorate is aware of. And we have enough electronic mechanisms. The internet, uh, you know, is a wonderful tool that you can know everything financially, how they're spending it, and then they could communicate their message. And the other thing, believe it or not, it would clean up as a lot of these negative campaign ads because what people don't understand about negative campaigns, if I got a limited budget, I can't run a positive campaign. The purpose, because that takes money to advocate a position, to talk responsibility, it's a lot easier to get into a mudslinging contest that uh, with half truce, that uh, it's a cheaper, because what you're trying to do, what people don't understand about a negative campaign, what you're trying to do is turn off certain electorates and you want them to get so disgusted that they go away. Why? Because they're not gonna vote for you. And, 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 and th th there is a rhyme or reason for that because it's a cheaper way to run a campaign than let's say trying to have a, uh, uh, a res what I'd call a responsible, this is what I am going to do with Social Security and I'm going to spend, you know, a million dollars explaining it to you in a detailed report I'll send to each and every one of your homes or something. Responsible, above board, positive campaigns are expensive. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Rod. Uh, it's obvious that some of you agree and some of you disagree, and uh, we usually don't change that, but I would say that the Dole Institute is proud to be able to present both sides of a lot of different issues, and we thank uh, Rod for coming out, and we thank all of you for coming out tonight. And frankly, I would challenge those of you who don't buy Rod's argument to look at the book because he deserves that. He took the time to write it and, uh, you know, read the book, take a look at it, then challenge what he has to say. Please have a nice evening. Hope to see you here next week. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Rod will be back in the back in the lobby signing books, and I'm going to move him back there right away. If you want to talk to